Um, I'm supposed to talk about uh, Yalda. Yalda uh, means uh, birth, and uh, it is the birth of the mythological god of ancient Iranians, Mithra, that after about 2,000 years, his name was changed into Mehr. So Mitra and Mehr are the same names in two different periods of the history of Iran. Um, the reason I wanted to give this talk was to remind you that about two decades ago, although most of us knew about a ceremony called Yalda, and we like to spend the night together and have a party and talk and eat and all that, we hardly had heard anything about Mithra. We didn't know that Yalda means birth, and it is the birth of the god Mithra. And I wanted to uh, tell you, remind you, that there should have something happened in our recent history that suddenly we have become curious about our roots and we have begun studying the roots and then we began to discover that we had some other reliefs that, uh, beliefs that, uh, than what we have now and um, we have come to know a lot about our ancient roots. <clears throat> This is uh, a part of a process that nowadays is called a identity crisis for the Iranians, especially outside Iran. For every society, there are some moments of history when they are inflicted by a crisis of identity. That means that a society suddenly finds itself in a situation that does not like it. And it is presented by its representatives to the other, to the rest of the world, in a manner that they don't like it. And everyone is not supposed to go and have a detailed research about these things, but there is a national wish a national desire to find out why we feel that whatever is represented, represented as us is not what you, we think we are. And that is why we embark on a search for identity. Um, in the recent centuries, two times this has happened in our society. And at both uh, incidents, uh, we have had a lot of discoveries about ourselves, about our roots, and why we are different from the rest of the world who are supposed to be like us. The first one in recent history was about 200 years ago, when um, uh, Russia, the Russian Empire, was uh, a powerful neighbor in the north of Iran, and uh, the clergy, the mullahs, the ayatollahs of the country, um, didn't like their policy in the northern parts of Iran, and uh, they declared jihad, which means the holy war, and pushed people to go and fight with the Russians for about for 500 years, we didn't have a big war like that. And the country was totally in chaos when we confronted the Russians in the battlefield. And they smashed us. We were defeated. We lost a lot of, a big part of our northern territories. The lands which are now Azerbaijan Shumali, or the northern Azerbaijan, on the west side of the Caspian Sea, and the land on Turkmenistan, and all that, which is on the east side, were lost to them. 
And our country actually shrank into this little cat which we have on the map. The result of that uh, war was a very fundamental psychological uh, upheaval in us. And our intellectuals began to ask why uh, uh, we, we were defeated, why we were so backward when we confronted a, an enemy uh, that has, was able to modernize itself and the, its armies and all that. And uh, because the initiators of the war were the clergy, the mullahs, ayatollahs, uh, and during the war, God didn't help the Iranians, the Muslims, and they were defeated, there was a resentment towards them. And they began to think about uh, Islam and um, somehow, you know, it, for, for centuries we had totally forgotten that we were an empire, the Persian Empire, um, the most powerful empire on the earth, and um, due to some reasons which is beyond my tonight's talk, we were defeated by the Arab Muslims who invaded Iran from the south and uh, um, plundered the country and literally raped the country in every aspect and not uh, only imposed their religion on us, a religion was totally different from ours. They were uh, successful to impose their traditions, their way of love and all that under the name of Islam. Uh, this discovery or rediscovery of a forgotten identity for us Iranian gave rise to a political movement which has been known as Constitutional Revolution of Iran, in the love of Iran. And a um, hundred years ago, uh, we tried to adopt a Western uh, style uh, parliament, a Western style government, and all that. The second crisis has come two decades ago by the advent and victory of the Islamic revolution. The revolution was not supposed to be an Islamic one. It was the result of the resentments of the people against uh, the atrocities of a dictatorship, but a modern dictatorship. But unfortunately, because that dictatorship was able to annihilate all the other alternatives, the only powerful establishment inside the country was the mosque and the ayatollahs, and they could take over the religion, uh, revolution. And Immediately after that, my generation began to experience something that we didn't even imagine. And it was the imposition of a series of uh, laws and regulations, behaviorism, which was totally even alien to the kind of Islam that we were uh, brought up in and our parents used to be um, adhering to. And um, especially this time, this crisis was coincided by a big immigration of Iranians coming out of that country because they couldn't tolerate the conditions, the political conditions, the social conditions, the economic conditions and all that. <coughs> And being living in uh, outside the country as an immigrant for two decades, we naturally had to uh, give way to a second generation of Iranians who are either uh, 
brought up here or born here. And this generation is receiving a very strange heritage from us and from the country who we belong to, which we belong to. Uh, and they have to rationalize it for the environment that they're living in. So my generation for one reason and my children's generation for the other reason, both of us are in a situation that we don't like what is being presented as Iran and Iranians. And we want to find out how we can, uh, we can prove that our identity is something different. And it is the might and force of this search for identity that has risen, that, that has given rise to our attention to things like Yalda and Chash and Basuri. Uh, I mean the uh, ceremonies, rituals that are not connected to Islam, are not connected to the present government, and the present government has shown its dislike of these things. For example, this year in, I mean, the, uh, during the Charshambe Suri, where the young people in Iran went to the streets and had celebrated the occasion, they had to put about 2,000 people in jail because they considered it as something un-Islamic. And it is really because of this un-Islamic nature of these ceremonies that they have become suddenly so popular. And I think that if we do not suffice to just throw a party and uh, have the ceremony and expand our knowledge about uh, what really these ceremonies, these rituals are about, there may be a key, a um, solution for a lot of our problems as a nation that wants to be a full member of the civilized world and is ashamed of what is being happening in, in our country. In fact, if you look at the history of Iran since the invasion of Arabs, I mean, the history of the last 1400 years, you will see that there hasn't been a decade where there wasn't a resistance movement going on against the Arab invasion and against the Arab uh, um, prevalence over the polity of our country. A lot of names that we give to our children are witness to that claim. Names like Babak, like Afshin, each one of these names are the representative of a movement of some Iranian who have risen against the Arabs and to have an a different identity, a challenging identity, has looked back to the pre-Arab history of Iran and searched for a kind of identity there. Even within the Islamic world of Iran, the same resistance has shown itself in cultural levels, literary levels, and all that. For example, our greatest poet of all times, Ferdowsi. Ferdowsi, after um, 400 years after the invasion of Arabs, uh, when there was no way to go out of this uh, you know, uh, prevalence of Arabic tradition and uh, religion over Iran, he decided to go back and revive the history of pre-Islamic Iran. And his masterpiece, uh, Shahnameh, 
if we read it well, if we listen to Ferdowsi and see what he is saying, he is reminding us about a different culture, a different history, a different way of living in the world, uh, which has been crushed by the Arabs. Further on, when you had to be, you know, during the, the Ferdowsi time, still you were not forced to be a Muslim if you pay taxes to the Muslim government. They, you, you could keep your religion. And there is a big, a fundamental belief that Ferdowsi never became a Muslim, although some Muslim writers have given him a name, Abu al-Qasim, and they call him Hakim Abu al-Qasim, but these are all uh, inventions. There is no uh, document to show that this is true. Um, and uh, there are otherwise documents which show that Ferdowsi and a lot of his entourage and the people who lived in that area of Khorasan, which is called, what, what used to be called Tus, and today we call it Mashhad, did not become Muslims till the fifth century. But after that, when we look at the works of our poets like Hafez, Saadi, and even Mawlana, who are talking in uh, Muslim jargon, using the same jargon that the other Muslims are using, if we look at the essence of that, we find that, that there is something fundamental opposing the mainstream of the um, Islamic thought. What we call the real Irfan, I'm not talking about Khanavas and Darvishes and all that. That is something totally different. The real Irfan which is advocated in Hafez, in Molana, in Shams Tabrizi, in our great uh, mystics, mystics, is opposing to the rigid framework of Islam. And if you look at the sources of these people, these grand peoples, we see that they go back to pre-Islamic period and uh, get their um, inspirations from there. I said that um, in the moments of such crisis, we go back to our old religion and uh, try to get whatever we need from that. And it immediately poses a new question, and that question is that we are escaping from a religion and we are going back to another religion. Isn't it ridiculous in the 21st century for a bunch of people who are harmed by a religion to seek another religion, a religion even older than Islam. And my main focus of talk tonight is about the nature of two different kinds of religion. Sociology of religion recognizes two different kinds of religion and calls them by two different names. The first kind of religion is called natural religion. And the second kind is called abstract religion. All the human societies, ancient human societies, began with the natural religions. By natural religions, means that um, I mean that human being wants was able to come out of the monkey period and had the power of rationalization and the inquest to, to find out why the world is like that, why it is behaving like that, why it is moving like that, and why it's changing like that. The first thing that in every society has happened is a process that we call it personification which means that we give personality to the elements of the 
nature around us. The sun has a personality. The sun comes, the sun shines, the sun moves through the sky from, west, from east to west and all that. All the behaviors of a person is attributed to the, an, a um, um, natural element, natural entity. It applies to clouds, it applies to the rivers, to the sea, to the trees and all that. And suddenly, uh, it is as if human being is expanding itself into the realm of the whole universe, the whole nature, and is dealing with the nature as if it is dealing with its other members of the society. A tree has life, has intentions, has functions, has role in our lives. This is a natural religion. There is nothing uh, attributed to something invisible. You see the elements. You deal with the elements. And sometimes you feel that you are unified with those elements. But after that first period, when societies began to settle in the cities, when the central government came around and complicated regulations and laws were needed, this way of looking at the world didn't function anymore. And out of that came the abstract religion. And by abstract, we mean that in these kind, this new kind of religion, there is a God that you don't see it. It is somewhere, it is residing in, in a realm that, which, is, which is not accessible by us. You cannot talk to him. He doesn't talk to you. Sometimes he chooses one of you and gives some orders or regulations to him to convey it to us. And all those regulations are limitations. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. All negation of what a free person does. So in every society, there is a dichotomy between the natural religion and the abstract religion. And when the abstract religion becomes more powerful and dominating than the, than the other elements of the society, people have no resort but to go back to the natural religion and get their inspirations from that source. The natural religion of those early tribes 8,000 years ago who were called Aryan tribes, Arya Iha, and who used to live in the steppes of Central Asia, was a natural religion with its own god, with its own pantheon of gods, that some of the, their names we still know. And one of them, and the most powerful of them, is Mithra. The whole ideology of the early natural religion of Iranians, or Aryans, actually, was that the, the source of life, the source of well-being, is the sun. I want to open a parenthesis here and remind you that the same sun when goes to Arabia, the peninsula, this is the most hated thing in the world. And the hell of Muslims and Jewish people is made of fire, of, of what sun is imitating. Whereas for Iranians who lived in those steppes, on the verge of cold weather, sun was the source. Sun was the best thing they could have. 
And the whole Weltanschauung, as the Germans say, their aspects of mind, the way they looked at the world was the worship of God, of Son, which they called Mithra. And naturally, all the good things were attributed to this God. Mithra brought life. Mithra enabled an architectural society to survive. Mitra brought prosperity to the, to the Aryan tribes. For some reasons that still the scientists are working on it, and it's not clear yet, these tribes of Central Asia 8,000 years ago decided to disperse all over the world. And their dispersion was aimed to all four corners of the world. Some of them went to the Far East, to where China and Japan, Japanese. Some of them went to the Indian subcontinent. Some of them went to uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Some of them came down from the two sides of the Caspian Sea to the Iranian Plato. Some of them went to uh, Greece. Some of them went to Central Asia. Remember Hitler claiming that he's an alien. Uh, and the interesting thing is, I mean, the first discoveries about this, this disbursement of alien tribes came when the uh, uh, linguistics and archaeologists got together put their heads together, their information together, and found out that among these people, there are certain uh, elements that they have kept after 8,000 years. And one of them is language. And if you look, if you read the history of languages and are interested in the linguistics, you will find out that there is a big branch of human languages which is called Indo-European languages. They say that there was a language up there in the Central Asia, which we don't know about it too much. And all the languages of India, Afghanistan, Iran, and Europe, Latin Europe, all of them have the roots there. And the linguists have been trying to, to build up, to find out how that language worked, what was the grammar of that language, and all that. The other interesting thing about this disbursement is the reminiscence of so many rituals and beliefs. For example, Iranians and Indians, they have got a lot of common gods. One of them is Mithra. Mithra is, was worshipped by Iranians and by the Indians. The stories about these gods are still the same with little variations. One of these variations which, is, which may be interesting to you is the story of uh, uh, discovery of fire. We know that uh, the Aryan tribes believed that at the beginning the world was a cold, dark, and dense place. I remember one of the scientists uh, uh, was quoting from Sanskrit texts and saying that it is so beautifully a uh, explanation of the black hole, or that, that black hole which began the Big Bang. Anyhow, the beginning of time, the beginning of life, before that, it, the whole world was dense, dark, 
and made of a stone. And it was out of that stone that Mitra was born. In the longest night of the year, which is Yandam. So Mitra comes out of the out of stone, out of that. Then in Ferdosi, when he tells us about the story of how human being discovered uh, fire. He says that fire was extracted from stone by Hu Shang Shah, one of the kings of the uh, mythological period of Iranian history. So Mitra comes out of the stone, and Hu Shang extracts the fire out of the stone. There is a uh, relationship between this stone and fire for us Iranians. <coughs> And fire is a representative of the sun in our culture. Some people think that Iranians are worshippers of fire, which is totally wrong. Iranians like fire and have esteem for it because it, it is a part of Mitra. It is a part of that um, uh, universal, you know, source of life. <coughs> if you go back to texts written by Hafez, for example, and see how he deals with the sun, and how he uses it in a symbolic way, you will, you will hear the echo of that ancient Iranian uh, belief which is absent in Arab literature. The unification of human being and its universe, which is called Vahdat Wujud in our literature, is a Mithraic thought. And the whole universe of Erfan in Iran is based on this. What I was saying was that there, there has been a tension between the natural religion and abstract religion all over the history in every society. And I just wanted to remind you about our own history and tell you that uh, when the Aryan tribes, three of them, were, we know definitely, one of them was, we call it the Mad, Madha, Meds they call it in English, Madha who came from the west side of uh, Caspian Sea down in the present Azerbaijan. The second one were Partha, who became Ashkanian, and they came from the east side of the Caspian Sea and settled in Khorasan and uh, Afghanistan. And the third one were Partha, where we, we, we get our Persian name from them, who came down to the edges of the uh, Persian Gulf and settled there. And Pars or Fars, Shiraz-e was made by them. These are the, the three main um, uh, Iranian tribes who came to this country, to this uh, Plato. And during the first uh, 2,000 years, were able to establish the Iranian or the Persian Empire uh, with the ruling of three different uh, 
families. The first one were Hachamanishis, the second one was Ashkanis, and the third one was Sasanis. The interesting thing is that Iranians, when they settled in the Iranian Plato and became people of cities, civilized people, uh, and established big empire, the first Iranian prophet appeared there. The beginning of the Iranian version of a abstract religion, Zoroaster, Zartusht. Zartusht is a prophet who talks about a omnipotent, omnipresent, a God that is all power, that is everywhere, and uh, uh, he is not accessible, you cannot see it, you cannot talk to it, and all that. All the aspects of an abstract religion is there. And he was opposed to Mithraism. Zoroasterism was totally against Mithraism. But all through the Hachamanishi period, this family refrained from adopting a state religion. We cannot see. It doesn't mean that they didn't have a religion. The king had a religion, the ministers had everyone. But there wasn't any state religion in Iran. There was a freedom of religion all over the country. And even in many of the uh, writings left for us on stones by the Hachamanishi kings, we see that they, for example, um, pray to uh, Ahur Mazda, who is the god of Zarastra, and Mithra, who is the god of ancient Iranian. So, um, and that is why, for example, when they come and conquer uh, the present Iraq, the Babylon, and all that, and free the Jews there, they even accept the gods of the Jews. This freedom prevented Iran to have a state religion. Then we were invaded by the Greeks. Alexander the Great came and ruined the country and all that. And after that, we revived by the kingship of the Ashkanids. There is a belief that they are working on it. And I think it is a very, very new chapter in the history of Iran um, that I hope will be revealed during the next 10 years that Ashkanis were uh, Mithraists or Mehrists, Ahle Mehr Buddha. And the name Ashk, which each king had, is the same word as ishq. Because you cannot find this word in Arabic. It is not an Arabic word. It is not a Turkish word. We don't know where this word ishq has come from. But there is a linguistic debate going on now which says ishq is Arabization of ashk. And uh, we know that most of the Ashkanic kings referred somehow to Mitra and for example, most of them were called Mehrdad, which means given by Mehr, and all that. So this, this mentioning of Mehr and Mehrdad goes through the Ashkanid period. But again, it doesn't become a state religion. It is only, I mean, the incident of having a state religion in Iran first comes about when in the Roman Empire, they decide to have a state religion, which is called Christianity. The adoption of Christianity by the Roman Empire is the cause of Iranians to adopt their own, because they thought that if they have got their own uh, religion and they're unifying the whole population under that ceiling, it is a threat. We have to do the same thing. 
And this happened in the Sassanid period, the third, uh, uh, the, to the fourth family who came to power in Iran. And <coughs> they decided to adopt Zoroastrian as the state religion and wipe out any other religious traits. They killed all the Mehrists, Mithraists. We know of a uh, prominent uh, prophet-like figure called Mani. Mani is a Mithraist. All his teachings comes from the Mithraism. And he was killed, and his followers were killed by the Zoroastrians of the Sassanid court. And many historians believe that it was the adaptation of a state religion by the Sassanid who, who, that worked against them and made them vulnerable so that the Arabs could invade Iran and get rid of the Sassanid Empire. This is something totally up to debate, and we can talk about it later. Uh, so, again, when, when, when the, the Islam was being adopted as the state religion of Iranian courts of Ghaznavi, Sultan Mahmoud of Ghaznavi, for example, immediately we see a reaction like what Ferdowsi did, going back to the sources of ancient Iran. And it comes up to today. One interesting thing that I would like to end my talk tonight on that note is that how did Christianity become the state religion of the Roman Empire in the fourth century of Christian calendar? Because it directly relates to us Iranians. During the Ashkani period, which our big wars with the Roman Empire began and lasted for 400 years and exhausted the two empires totally, <coughs> most of the ordinary people of Iran, most of the soldiers who were fighting in the battlefields were Mehris. Their, their religion was worship of Mithra. And uh, they say that Mithraism went from Iran to Rome by many ways, by sea, by land, but mostly by those soldier, Iranian soldiers who were captured in the wars and were taken to the Rome. And it was their, their beliefs were so interesting and powerful for the um, um, army of the Roman Empire that Mithraism became the uh, religion of the army in Roman Empire. Wherever they went, they made big, you know, um, worship places for Mithra, and they. they invented Mithraism according to their needs. Mithraism went from Iran to Rome, but it didn't remain the same Mithraism that it was originally in Iran. It is totally something else. Nowadays, when you go and read books about Mithraism, most of your sources refer you to the Roman Empire and tell you about so many different rituals and beliefs that was advocated and adopted in the Roman Empire period. And then if you uh, think that, OK, Mithraism is from Iran, so they have adopted all of these from Iran, you're wrong. There is a certain uh, rewriting of Mithraism in Rome. But the, the central uh, place of the sun, the Mithra, the god of sun remains prominent and it's the worship to him and all that. 
Now, this happened within the barracks of the uh, Roman soldiers. So the, 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 the religion of the soldiers was, myth, was Mithraism. But there was something, uh, something else going on between the people. In the realm of the Roman Empire, which began from the west of Iran and covered all through Europe, there was two religions side by side. One was Mithraism, which was advocated by the generals, by the army officers, and by the soldiers of the Roman Empire. And the other one was Christianity. The belief in a man who is the son of the Hebrew God and he's sent to the earth for salvation of the human being, whatever we know about Christianity. Christianity became so widespread in the Roman Empire that in the fourth century there was a political decision to adopt Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire. But this adaptation had to take the armies wishes into account. It was there that they decided in the Roman Empire, in the Rome, to mix these two uh, religions together and make something which answers to the demands of both of these inclinations. And the Christianity which was made in Rome and was advocated by the popes who were centralized in Rome was that mixture. Actually, what did happen in the Roman Empire of the fourth century of Christian calendar was the unification of the figure of Mithra with the figure of Jesus Christ. One of the prominent things that they did for this unification was to accept a date for the birth of the Christ. If you go back to the Hebrew uh, documents, uh, Jesus Christ, whoever he was, was not born in winter. But we know that for 8,000 years, or at that time for 6,000 years, Iranian believed that their god, whose name was Mithra, was born in the longest night of the year. So they, they decided to give this birth night to Christ. And by some juggler work, um, um, the calendar was uh, now has become 25th, whereas uh, originally it was 21st um, um, of December, which is the first day of Iranian months of day. We call it day. Um, and uh, for 6,000 years, Iranian all over the Iranian Plato and also in the Central Asia, were uh, throwing parties, having fun at that night because their god was being born at that night. It had psychological, literary, and cultural meanings for them. If you 
read the Persian literature of all over history, even the Islamic period, you will see that the dichotomy between darkness and light, between night, between moon and the sun, all of that have got significant personal and social meaning. For Iranians, as soon as you open the book of Hafez and see that he says, uh, well, don't worry, this night will go away and sun will shine again, you can interpret it, it in different levels of personal or social meanings. <clears throat> the other thing which uh, was adopted uh, by the, that amalgamation of Christianity and Mithraism was the three. Iranians for 6,000 years, Iranians, I mean the, those tribes that lived in the steppes of Central Asia, used to cut tall evergreen trees which we call today sarv. The English word for it is cypress tree, I don't know, evergreen. I have seen it in Cali California, but not here. These tall green uh, trees. They used to cut it, put it in their cottages, and uh, uh, give uh, different presents to the god Mithra. They hanged it over the tree, decorated it. And it was transported to the Christianity to celebrate the birth of Christ. So all said, what I want to say is that we are discovering that not only the Western world and us are genetically related, we come from the same source, the language, our languages are the same. Our rituals and our beliefs are the same as well. And none of them has anything to do with the Arab and Hebrew culture. There are two different worlds. And the imposition of this culture over the Iranian one has resulted in a, I think, a schizophrenic uh, attitude. We are, we are bewildered because many of the things, as I mentioned, for example, the role of the sun in the beliefs of the Aryans and Arabs, source of life there, source of hell there, you can, you can see it in so many different things. Um, so it is a dichotomy. And um, for us who have been able to come out of that country and we are living in the West, uh, the good news is that uh, we shouldn't feel so alien here. We come from a land that has given our hosts a lot of their beliefs, a lot of their rituals, and um, they, find, they found it beautiful and we are honored that these beautiful things were invented by our, our own forefathers. Um, <laughs> we are actually in the presence of a natural religion, we are a configuration of natural elements, a mixture of wind, earth, water, and fire. And between the two brackets of ashes, according to the Christian faith, it is the fire that symbolizes our life and well-being. Fire makes us and it swallows us. And we make fire 
and tame it to make our life better. There is a undeniable relationship between us and fire. As though we are made of fire. And uh, let me finish uh, my talk with just one line of our great poet Hafez who by the magic of his poetics reverses this relationship between man and son and uh, that cause and effect relationship which says that son is keeping us alive in his poetry becomes reversed. He says, زن آتش نهفته که در سینه من است خورشید شعله است که در آسمان گرفت Out of the hidden fire in my chest sun is just a flame that keeps the sky ablaze Thank you and happy and merry yalda